Welcome to uh, my exhibit, which I've titled The Ordinary Spectacle. And so, as you can tell from the title, it's a bit of an oxymoronic title. Uh, the threads of my work that have been going for years really look at uh, human behavior and human relationships uh, with a modern contemporary environment. And so some of the themes that you'll see in the exhibit today, uh, but that are long-running threads, deal with technology, our uses of technology, and um, impact to the environment, and I would say just our relationship to the landscape. So starting with this piece here, this is titled Spectacular Attraction, and a couple of the recurring aesthetic uh, aspects that you'll notice tying the pieces together is there's this symmetry um, and the doubling uh, effect that happens because I made these works with uh, a similar process to the Rorschach test, uh, ink blots. And so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later. But other things that you may notice as you're looking at these pieces is that uh, there's some nuance to them. They are symmetrical and there's the doubling of the figures, but there's slightly, um, you'll notice that things aren't aligned exactly the same from each panel. Another unique feature is the pigments that I've used, that I've experimented with, are um, iridescent and duochrome pigments. So as you move across, and if you look from different angles, you'll see the places in the sky will maybe turn from blue to gold. And in, this is what I consider a mushroom cloud explosion. It turns from copper to sheens of gold. So, this uh, piece, obviously, you can see there's a uh, very beautiful woman sunbathing on the beach, and there's this spectacle in the background, which could be a disastrous event, could be a beautiful event, and then there's these two billboards. And so in the titling of this spectacular attraction, I guess I was thinking about, you know, the figure being obviously a traditionally attractive um, figure here, but also the reference of the billboard um, being a reference to consumerism and advertising, the kind of the spectacle and attraction that uh, that is for our society. But I want to speak about this series for a moment here. And there's a couple things I could mention about it. So conceptually, I was really interested in this figure in the latex suit, right? And the title of the pieces is called Fetish Factory. And so, of course, we have the three figures in the latex suit. But in this bottom image, what you can see here, and it's fairly vague, but it's a, the same image of that oil refinery. Conceptually, I was really interested in this image of the oil refinery up against this image of a person in a latex suit, which is essentially a petroleum product. And um, you know, these are some of the things that I strive to bring into my artwork is that kind of complicated nature. Of, of course, I'm not demonizing uh, eroticism and sexual fetish, but I find it fascinating. Like, how do we get to that point where um, wrapping yourself in entirely a petroleum product is uh, an erotic desire, and then how that's linked to climate change is, like, I think, ultimately fascinating. The way that I was able to make this image was by using the laser engraver to carve uh, a relief plate, essentially, on a piece of wood. And then this paper's so soft, in order to get the image to the paper, I didn't even need to, like, ink it up like you would a relief block but instead I just soak the paper and then press the, uh, that embossment. It's called, yeah, it's called embossing. In this exhibit, I have a number of graphite drawings, uh, pencil on paper, and the type of paper that I've used is uh, actually a printmaking paper. It's called Somerset Velvet. It's not one that people would typically like prefer for drawing. Um, so it's pretty soft. It's like a really soft rag and it's kind of fuzzy. But when I started drawing, I really liked it for those effects because 
at the time I was looking at these kind of images of people in natural disasters, you can see these two here deal with water. This is like a figure in a flooded, I guess, harbor. And this is a piece is titled Story of the Hurricane, in which you see this man sort of futilely attempting to fight the effects of a hurricane with a gas-powered leaf blower, you know, to try to blow the hurricane back the other direction. Uh, but at the same time, I was looking at some appropriated images of really scenes of people lighting these flares. In most cases, they were participants of climate change protests, lighting these pink flares and doing demonstrations, but the kind of softness of the paper allowed me to get these really kind of fuzzy images of the kind of clouds of the, of the road flares and the plumes that those were making. I was also looking at cumulus clouds. These are titled Lot 1, 2, 3, and 4. They were made fairly quickly, um, but this is kind of the result of some experimentation. It was really right after pandemic lockdown. I just had gotten back into my studio. I really felt the need to do something quick. I had made another painting just before this that toyed with this idea of the Rorschach test, the Rorschach plot. And, you know, even without really having done a lot of research about Herman Rorschach, the Swiss uh, psychiatrist and his, you know, studies like in the early 20th century about this, I just was drawn to the aesthetic. And for me, they were interesting because the kind of nature, either being explosive and looking like these kind of explosions, symmetrical explosions, or how when turned on their side, they read as uh, landscapes. Again, these, this series, so as we go to the left, you'll sort of see, these are mostly focusing on these kind of mundane interactions, like people that I sort of spied on out in the environment, sitting on a park bench, sleeping in public, and other people, beach goers. Um, but out in these environments that I like to think of as maybe incomprehensible to us because there's uh, so much happening in there. And actually, there's something I can tell you about how the way that I you know, include these architectural forms I talked about wanting to really show these relationships between people interacting with these giant forms that they maybe can't make sense of. Um, but technically, the way I was able to incorporate these in here was to um, utilize a lot of computer fa fabrication uh, technology, so including laser engraving, vinyl, uh, plotter, and so all computer program aided ways of uh, manipulating my photographs of these forms and then to output them to different forms. For you to understand that, I can take you to the hallway and show you. Um, maybe a good way of understanding this is to first point to the exhibition title. This is standard, you know, in so many museums or even just commercial spaces, you'll often see this on the glass. It's a vinyl sticker that is um, cut by a plotter. So you can do your designs in a graphic program and then it's output to what's called vinyl plotter and it's machine cut because it's machine cut way quicker than cutting these things by hand, right? Um, now the way that I've applied it in my artwork, if you're going to do such a lovely uh, sign like the Shun Gallery staff did here where the letters are nice and evenly spaced and nice and flat. There's a technique for that using transfer tape, but I've intentionally knocked on that. And so I have these, these are images that I took and then translated into threshold to a high contrast black and white using Photoshop and then machine cut with the vinyl plotter. And then when I peeled them out, I just am a little bit more messy about it intentionally to let these sort of distortions happen. So if you actually, to come and to really look at it up close, you can see that the sticker is kind of folding on itself and that there are actually wrinkles along through the piece. So not only is it like a black and white image, but it's almost sculptural a little bit. There's some 
tiny amount of 3D quality to it. And it's also what makes these kind of distorted uh, giant structures look like they're maybe falling down and gone through an earthquake or are melting from a hot fire or something. I just kind of love that quality. What you see here are again, these kind of Rorschach block process uh, with each painting. But then over top, I've used a laser engraving um, machine to burn that same image back in over top of the painting. And this particular one here, you can see it's kind of a ghostly image of the power line on the left and then another one on the right. And that's just by modifying the strength of the laser. So uh, this one on the right, you can see it's etched a little bit deeper um, into that paper burn all the way through. It gets, becomes kind of really textural. In this case, you can see it's the image of a nuclear power plant, actually. Well, not a power plant, it's a nuclear airplane engine. It's an experimental project uh, from the United States government. This actually exists in Orco, Idaho. So it's out in the middle of the desert, and it's just this large structure on train tracks. Um, and what the US government was trying to do was build an airplane engine that was fueled by a nuclear reactor. And so theoretically, this plane could fly around the world forever without having to fuel up as long as the pilots could keep it going. And so these were, again, silk screen with a clear varnish directly into white paper. And then if you look closely, it's like a indigo watercolor and um, uh, iridescent kind of gold together. So um, I just think it's fantastic, the sort of freedom that happens in the shape. And there's these kind of moments where the paint reticulates and almost looks like some kind of clouded exploding here. And um, then that contrast of sort of the loose ink form up against this heavy industrial architecture. So this is a recurring image, actually, of this reactor that is kind of thread throughout some of the paintings. This was the very last painting I made. Again, it features this now infamous nuclear reactor that I'm using over and over again. That actually, this image is from the same block that I just showed you. So. In this case, I've inked the block uh, after doing the embossment, inked it with white ink and pressed it to uh, this heavy cold pressed watercolor paper in advance of doing any painting. And I already sort of had the whole compositional plan and knew what I want in the image. These are oftentimes designed with, uh, I do some drawing and use digital tools to play my composition. So. I had it planned out and I, and I printed these uh, oil-based ink relief prints in here. And then, again, kind of following this Rorschach block technique. The difference really in aesthetic between this painting and the earlier Rorschach blocks is due to the nature of watercolor. I've soaked the paper first on all of these, and it gives it a much softer effect. A wet into wet wash, beautiful for like clouds, wispy clouds, you know, mist, these like soft, you can see there's so much granulation, especially if you get up close here, there's some very dark moments of pigment that you see literally how the pigment moves um, with the water. It's just quite, quite beautiful. Um, so I soaked the paper and then again, kind of experimentally drop this uh, pigment to one sheet. And then actually the reason why these became diptych, you notice it's a, it's a two panel, two paper piece to make one painting. It's because I couldn't bring myself eventually when I got, got to the, this point, I had planned to fold them in half, but the paper was too nice. You know, so I invested on the paper, but it's a nice heavy, heavyweight watercolor paper. And I wasn't actually sure that when you fold it in half, it will break really heavyweight water that people might do that. So, but I, won't, I didn't even try because maybe I will, but uh, just too beautiful a piece of paper. But what that's done in the painting is also there's sort of a subtlety because they're, they're heavier weight than the other paintings. And depending on which paper I decide to drop the pigment into first, it uh, looks almost symmetrical, but slightly different. So there's this subtlety.
And then lastly, but not least, the figures. I didn't talk too much about the figures throughout any of the others, but in order to get this like soft, spectacular, uh, abstract painting with loose edges, that's just throwing paint right in the paper and kind of seeing what happens. But in order to, because watercolor is not an opaque medium, I needed to pre-plan where I wanted the figures, where I want people, and to stencil them out. And for that, I used a different material, but basically it's a water impervious stencil that I could stick down to block out where I wanted the figures to be. And so I put that in ahead of time um, to sort of keep those areas clean. And then that means the figures would be the last thing that I would, would go in into paint. And so you might notice that uh, I talked earlier about the fetish factory pieces and that in general, uh, there's a play between some kind of ordinary people hanging out in the environment and then these like high, more highly sexualized and eroticized figures. And so um, I suppose I'm really just interested in showing both uh, aspects of that, like the ordinary spectacle title is meant to draw attention to I guess really the idea that these natural disasters, not natural disasters, but climate change effects and disasters of the sea and the news media are happening more and more frequently. And even though they are spectacular and unusual or at some time longer, maybe a little bit more unusual because of their frequency, because of our awareness of them, there's like this blurring of the line. And so I guess I've tried to do the same thing with my figures and that some of the uh, figures might be a little bit Sometimes I have new figures out in the landscape, right? And um, so I wanted to call attention to that. But also because I feel like my task as an artist is really to make my work speak, to be relevant to today. And it's such an increasingly complex uh, world that we live in that I feel like you have to kind of mention every aspect. And I guess sex and desire are, I see as like driving and motivating factors. You can maybe take it even beyond sex, but human desire, right? Like hope, desire for something, uh, or desire when we can, as we speak of it, in a sense of consumerism as well, are these extremely motivating and driving factors for probably almost every person. Um, but aren't always acknowledged or maybe even talked about. And so that's why I wanted to bring them to one of the 